Released in 1983 by Tangerine Computer Systems, the Auric One was shipped as two models, which was typical for its time. The 16K or a 48K model, complete with a 6502 running at just under 1 MHz. The 16K was originally priced at £129, which calculates at just under £410 in today's money, whereas the 48K model was priced at £169 which would be just under £540 in today's money. So what happened to the Auric? Why has it been lost to history unlike notable other microcomputers of its time, such as our obvious friends with the rubber keyboard? This story is going to answer those questions for you. This is the Battle of the Auric. Let me begin by giving some background context of Tangerine Computer Systems and what brought them into the home computer market. Tangerine Computer Systems was based in Cambridgeshire, England and was founded in 1979 by Dr. Paul Johnson, Mark Rainier and Nigel Penton. The Microtan 65 was one of the first 6502 base kit computers which Tangerine sold as a kit or pre-built computer back in 1979 which was sold for just under £80 which in today's money works out to around £397. You also had a pre-built option for £90 which in today's money would be around £450 so pretty expensive stuff but this was after a new technology at the time. It also boosted with a massive one kilobyte of RAM. These were aimed generally at laboratories and a minor computer enthusiast audience at this point. These type of machines were not available to purchase in shops. The 6502 was very popular during the British computer boom. Most microcomputers and even some console of the late 1970s to the early 1990s contained a 65C2 or certainly a variant of it. Nintendo, a quick loading cartridge system with over 60 of the hottest titles ever. The late 1970s was a time of electronic innovations and this gains an interest in the public arena. Press of a switch. There we are. This is the, the CFAX information page. In fact, this is just the index. I have here a little push button device, which is a little bit like a, a pocket calculator. And by looking down the index, here we are, news headlines, page 101. Hobbyists was also interested in soldering components to boards and thus creating their own computer. It also saved them some money too. This led to the public not only getting a knowledge in electronics but also led them into computer programming which in turn created an industry in its own right. In the background of Tangerine Computer Systems we of course had Clive Sinclair. Sinclair Computers Limited launched a ZX80 price at 9995 in 1980, which in today's money works out to just under £500, which at the time was the cheapest option for entering a newly created computer revolution. The BBC Microbit Icon Computers released its premium computer in the December of 1981, the Model A for £235, which in today's money would be just under £885. And they also released a very popular Model B, which today will cost just under £1,260. August of 1982 also seen a release in the UK of the C64, which was priced at £299 on launch. In today's money, the C64 would be roughly around £1,035. And so there was a battle for companies to create a much cheaper solution and thus make home computing much more affordable in Thatcher's Britain. We also face a continuing battle against the terrorists and those who take hostages. And so followed the ZX81 in February of 1982, and a couple of months afterwards in April of 1982, the world was introduced to the ZX Spectrum. Much like the Auric 1 was about to have, the ZX Spectrum had two options, 16K model or a 48K model, and was based on the popular Zilog ZX80 processor, running at 3.5 MHz, which was much faster than the 6502, running at just under 1 MHz, that the Auric was soon to be shipped with. Sinclair hit Britain big with this new micro, which was priced at £125 or £175 respectively, 
which was clearly a bargain compared with Acorn's BBC Micro or the American solution to home computing, the Commodore 64. These were like most early computers, a mail order affair initially. In the background of Sinclair's major success, we had several different computer and research companies that inevitably wanted a piece of Sinclair's action. The original fan base of the Microtan 65 suggested to the team at Tangerine to develop a new home computer with having the public knowledge of the ZX Spectrum being such a massive success story. Tangerine then formed Auric Products International Limited to develop and release their Auric 1. The Auric 1 released in the first part of 1983, priced between $99.95, or that's just over £330 in today's money, and $169.95 for the 48K model, which were both strategically priced at a lower price than the ZX Spectrum, as at which point ZX Spectrum was a significant seller and any competitor wanting to capture an audience, which already bought into the Sinclair band, had to think strategically. Miraculously though, Auric 1 sold very well in France, achieving around 50,000 unit sales and become the best selling machine of 1983. In total, the UK sold around 160,000 machines in 1983, which in total sold 210,000 units. Whereas the ZX Spectrum sold around 5 million units in its entire lifespan, which was between 1982 and 1992. To make matters worse for the Auric 1, Sinclair dropped the price of their ZX Spectrum to $99.95 for the 16K model and $129.99 for the 4K model in early 1983. And so the popular 48K model was cheaper than the Auric 1's 48K model, which appears to be another strategic move to continue with Sinclair's success story here in Britain. Much like Sinclair, Auric found it difficult to keep up with orders being so high, and so much like Sinclair, Auric had major delays for customers to receive their new computers. Tragically, one night in October of 1983, Kenya Plastics in Cambridgeshire, England, who manufactured the Auric was severely damaged in an arson attack, where a significant portion of components were destroyed, which further caused delays in shipping out orders. Was this pulled off by another company? No, actually it turned out that the corporate returned a day later to burn down another building in the area. It said that Oryx staff began production once again in less than 24 hours of the attack. The production of Oryx one discontinued in 1984, likely due to damage of stock and poor sales compared with the Sinclair. A selling point for the Oryx one was its keyboard, which at the time was an upgrade to Sinclair's rubber keys. It was also an upgrade in terms of sound, whereas the Auric 1 shipped with a dedicated sound chip known as AY38910. Interestingly, the same chip was used in the Amstrad CPC, MSX, and popular Atari ST computers, whereas the ZX Spectrum simply had a beeper. Both computers did suffer from the attribute clash, however, the Auric 1 could prevent this somewhat if it was using its high res mode. Another feature or improvement over the Sinclair had to offer was Auric 1's slight elevation to make typing a little easier, whereas our rubber friend was flat and more awkward to type with for some. Both computers used predominantly cassette-based media for programs and games. It has been argued that Auric 1 had an uncertain level of success in loading programs and games. Auric 1 also had a disk drive add-on, but of course, these in Britain were also expensive, and like most of Britain of that era, cassettes were much cheaper to the average person. BASIC was a standard operating system during this time, and so the Auric 1 had its own variation of BASIC known as Auric Extended BASIC Version 1, whereas the Spectrum had its own version of BASIC known as Sinclair BASIC. Both machines had RF modulators in order to run the standard PAL televisions in Britain at the time. ZX Spectrum screen run at 256 by 192 pixels with a total of 15 colors, whereas the Auric 1 ran at 240 by 200 pixels and just 8 colors. Finally, Auric shipped with its own weaker CPU at just under 1 MHz, compared to the Spectrum's 3.5 MHz. In terms of graphic capabilities, both computers also sported its own custom ULA. 
At the end of 1983, Auric Products International Limited sold help from Eden Spring Investments PLC, in which they invested £4 million into the production of this up and coming new revised Auric computer, in which Eden Spring became Auric's parent company. This was to be named as the Auric Atmos. The Auric Atmos released in the beginning of February 1984 at a cost of £170 for the 48K model. Once again, consumers had the option of a 16K or 48K machine. The 16K machine could not be upgraded unlike other microcomputers could at the time. The striking features of the Atmos was its cosmetics. It looked beautiful and still does today. A nice mix of black and orange to give it a real vibrant appearance. The keyboard was also a major upgrade too, which was arguably an improvement over rubber keys. This mechanical keyboard felt like a more sturdy and premium implementation to cheaper computers at the time. The operating system which Atmos came with was a revised version of BASIC, which was named as Auric Extended BASIC version 1.1. This included the implementations of new BASIC commands that were not in the original Auric BASIC. Atmos had ongoing issues with loading good sets, much like his older brother did. Another issue with the Atmos suffered with was its voltage regulator, and despite changing the heat sinks, in some cases to prevent overheating, most would still fail from time to time. Generally, the Atmos was identical in terms of hardware and operating system that it came shipped with. Of course, it was also still priced higher than the ZX Spectrum, who cut the cost of their popular rubber-keyed computer back in early 1983. And of course, while Auric 1 was failing to meet an audience that Sinclair dominated at this point, the Atmos was doomed before it really began. Kids in school would largely own a ZX Spectrum and swap games, duplicate games too. Spectrum at this point owns the hearts of many children around Britain. Atmos sold very well in the Netherlands as well as France, just like its older brother the Auric 1 did. And it was thanks to the Atmos which began several computer gaming companies. Here in the UK at this point, Sinclair and Commodore was a tough competition and also the arrival of the Amstrad CPC 464. February of 1985, it was revealed that there would be several new machines coming such as the Auric Stratos, which according to myth, only five or six Stratos machines was ever produced, making this machine one of the rarest computers around today, right next to the Commodore 65. The Atmos production finally discontinued in 1985, at which point Eden Spring discontinued financing Auric as sales wasn't enough to profit from, and so French company Eureka bought Eden Spring and briefly continued to produce Auric Atmos machines for a short period of time. So finally, the last Auric the world would see would be the Auric Telestrap. This was released in 1986. Its main function was to act as a telecommunications device and work alongside the French Minitel, which was a French video text terminal. Eureka increased the RAM from 48 kilobyte to 64 kilobyte and added some more ports on the machine, but kept the same 6502 CPU and ULA for its graphics and the same sound chip the AY38910. It used Hyper Basic as its operating system as well as abilities to use both cassette and floppy disk as its media. It is estimated that around 6,000 Telestrats were sold. By 1988, the Auric Telestrat discontinued production for the obvious reasons. Only 6,000 units of the Telestrat in the space of its existence was clearly not viable to continue as a company, and so for the last time, 1988 seen the end of Auric computers. Here in 2023, there is a massive homebrew scene. We have got the Arebus, which is an SD card flash cartridge by 8BitTronics, which allows users to plug into an Auric 1 or the Atmos expansion ports which it auto starts dot tap files and acts as a turbo tape drive which runs at lightning speeds. It also cuts down and preserves original hardware from wearing out. Auric 1 and the Auric Atmos both have an thriving homebrew scene and many games are produced by original fans as well as newcomers to the computer here in 2023. All in all, the Auric 1 tried its very best but failed for the obvious reasons. It was up against a big bad boy such as Sinclair. Thanks for watching and I hope you look forward to the next episode in this documentary series. Take care.
So thanks for watching my documentary. It's taken me a considerable amount of time gathering the resources and everything else which goes into a documentary, and especially this one. Some of the footage was very hard to get as well with some of the pictures. So if you want future upcoming documentaries delivered straight to you before they hit YouTube, check out Patreon and also check out Buy Me A Coffee where you'll be able to get exclusive access to upcoming monthly documentaries covering different microcomputers. I've also set up a PayPal where if you wish to do donate to my channel to make things better and sound better then go ahead and make that donation and a thanks is always in place thanks for watching